My name is Courtney Johnston. I'm the director of the Douse Art Museum out in Lower Hutt. It's my very great pleasure to be here today to welcome Mallory to the festival. Well, back to the festival. It's already your second appearance. Um, on behalf of the festival, I would like to thank the Lion Foundation, Victoria University of Wellington, Creative New Zealand, QT Museum Wellington, and Unity Books for their support of these events. So Mallory is the co-founder and lead writer of The Toast. Uh, she is the author of the 2014 book, Text from Jane Eyre. Um, and she's also the advice um, columnist for Slate, which we're gonna talk about a little bit today. Uh, Mallory fascinates me not only as a happy feminist, um, which was the uh, role that she was performing in Sydney a couple of days ago, um, or as a humorist who uses the classics of Western literature and the art canon as fodder for her writing, um, but is also as someone who's successfully running an independent online publishing business, which is no small thing in today's environment. So I'm really looking forward to this morning. Oh, well, thank you. I'm really glad to be here. <laughs> so I thought before we started talking about you as a writer, we might start talking about you as a reader, because it's really clear from your work that you've read not only kind of extensively through all the great names of the English Lit courses, but the great names of kind of childhood and teenage reading, like The Babysitter's Club and Sweet Valley High and things like that. And I was wondering if you could start us off just by talking about the things that, that you remember reading as a child and as a teen, the things that kind of sunk in and shaped you. Oh man, yeah. So uh, like a lot of people, I was introduced to Sweet Valley High through my cool older cousin, Courtney. Um, <laughs> and she had all of them like lined up in order. You know, like the, you know, the numbers are all on the spine and it was just so like satisfying seeing them all like that, including like the murder mystery weekend ones and like super university or whatever. Um, so those, those really stood out in my mind. Um, just aesthetically, they were really delightful. Um, and I remember the big Dallaire's book of, of Greek myths. You know, the one with mm. the big, I think it's, it's um, either Icarus on the front or who's the guy who was Apollo's son and tried to drive the chariot and it didn't work out, it got too fast. Yeah. That, that one. That yeah, yeah, him. Thank you. That was going to drive me crazy. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> Phoebus. And he's, you know, trying to drive the sun and it's going super badly for him, um, as, as it would for many of us. Um, those really stood out to me. Um, I remember getting a copy of Bullfinch's Mythology when I was 12 and being super into that for a while. Um, it was very exciting stuff. Um, and I have already kind of forgotten your question, which I think was just generally about reading yeah. in childhood, childhood, which I did. Reading. I did both of those things. I read and I was a child. <laughs> um, and I've successfully completed both of them. And were you a, um, were you a Joe March kind of kid? Had you decided that, you know, you were going to shave your head for charity and then be a writer as well? Or? I was not as cool and outdoorsy as Joe Marsh, <laughs> I think. I, I really have to acknowledge. I think a lot of people want very much to identify with Joe, especially as young people. Um, but let's face it, very few of us are Joe, you know? <laughs> like, we're just not. Um, and, and there are times when I need to admit that I'm a little more Meg than I would like to be. Oh, really? Um, just like... You know what I mean? She liked like having a kitchen and like being inside. And you know, at the time, <laughs> I was very like, oh, like how? Ugh. And now I'm like, oh, Meg wasn't too far off from what I love, which is being comfortable 99% of the time. I'm just imagining the version of our conversation where you were like, I really identify with Beth. <laughs> I mean, I don't. I, 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 it's hard to identify someone who just dies of like. <laughs> question mark? Like, what did she actually <laughs> die of? No one knows. It was just like, oh, the window's so far away. <sighs> um, I did have one totally unreal. It's, it's sort of like, um, I did a piece a while back called Which Jane Austen Heroine Are You? And it's not an actual quiz. It's just, you're not Elizabeth Bennet. And you need to acknowledge that. Um, you know, you're, you're barely even... Um, like anyone from Mansfield Park. Like you're just, you're just not. Like you've never captivated anyone. Your eyes don't sparkle. Um, you get too drunk too fast at dinner parties and you're more tiresome in conversation than you know. It's just like you need to deal with the fact that you are not Lizzie Bennet. Um, and I think that's something that we all need. That's a dream we all need to die to before we can find our realist, truest selves. Like you're not. I, like, I kind of need everybody to just like think, you don't have to say it out loud, but just like acknowledge to yourself for a minute that you're not Lizzie Bennet. And I'll do it too. <laughs> And we can all be sad about that for a minute and then sort of move on. <laughs> so you're, you're not Lizzie Bennet. Nope. None of us are Lizzie Bennet. Nope. Um, I'm ba barely her dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm barely her dad. Oh, 
that Dave was kind of cold. He was the worst. He was just like, you guys seem like you're having problems deciding where you're going to live after I die. I will be reading a newspaper in my library. <laughs> I will be no help with this problem, whatever. But I'm kind of funny at dinner time, so... <laughs> Um, I wasn't expecting us to go there quite that early in the talk, but that, yeah. it happened. <laughs> we went there, yeah. So let's, um, let's segue over um, with no link into the toast. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about the origin story? Yes, yeah, I definitely can. So the toast, just in case anyone's not super familiar, is a site that I run with my business partner, Nicole Cliff. Um, it is a website that's generally based on whatever she and I think will be interesting that given day. Um, we've, we've been running it now since July of 2013, so we're coming up on our third anniversary, which is very exciting. Um, and we run a lot of different stuff. We, we publish, you know, um, first-person essays, some original reporting. Um, we have a column I really like called Gal Science. Um, I also feel like we should bring back the word gal more often. <laughs> um, uh, we don't have to, I just think it'd be nice. Um, and then whatever jokes I happen to think of on any given day. Um, and, and our origin story is sort of, she was working at a website called The Hairpin as the book's editor, and I was writing a lot on the side and working in publishing, and we would talk a lot about, you know, wouldn't it be great if we started a site together someday? Um, and then we just sort of slowly got closer and closer to that goal, and then when I had quit my job to write full time, I was more available, and so we started talking about what it would actually look like to do that, um, and then we did it, and now we do it. So that is the origin <laughs> story. <laughs> um, I think there's been a kind of traditional path um, of sorts for, for writers, you know, you, you write short stories, they go into collections, you, um, you write for journals, you put together your first kind of poetry anthology, but your, your writing has kind of evolved alongside the internet. You know, you've yeah. written for lots of, of different outlets. How do you feel that's shaped you as a writer? Well, I feel like in some ways I'm sort of in a weird position somewhere between a blogger and a fiction writer, right? Mm. Like, I, I was never going to be the kind of person who had a lot of, like, would submit to a handful of journals and then sit around and wait. Um, I, I, not that that's not a wonderful thing to do, just I was much more uh, kind of involved in the daily, the daily turnover mm. of the internet. Um, and uh, then on the other hand, it was also clear to me after I spent some time writing for Gawker and The Gloss and a couple of other sites that I was not great at like finding the, the the latest news and like putting a really interesting spin on it and and then and writing about it in such a way that would get lots and lots of people to click on it so i think i'm not quite good at either end and um in the middle with something where i was like oh i can kind of do this i can write a lot of jokes that are vaguely connected to right now um <laughs> or also the past um <laughs> Yeah, so it was definitely not a career path that I mapped out in a really significant way um, and, and very much sort of happened as, you know, I think like Twitter informed my writing mm. in a really way that I could not have predicted. Like there's this whole kind of humor that is sort of native to Twitter um, that, that really influenced my own work in a way that I didn't even realize until it was too late. Yeah. I've heard um, the toast described as being like a an intellectual playground for internet librarians, which uh, it sounds like a, a tiny segment, but actually the internet librarians, they are my people. I love librarians, um, man. Oh, I love librarians. They're great. Have we got any librarians in the audience? Yeah. Hi, guys. Love you guys. Um, what do you know about your readers, and how do you imagine them? Um, I imagine them all as just <laughs> wonderful 10-foot-tall Amazons made of gold. Um, <laughs> Uh, gosh, what are, so, so demographically, we are more than just librarians and archivists. Um, the, the, we have a, a surprisingly large international readership, mm. that more than I would have guessed. Um, a lot of them are in their like 20s, 30s, 40s. A lot of them work in higher education, but a lot of them also don't. Like a lot of people um, who just don't work in academics read us too, which is great, because I was never an academic. Um, but people who I think have really strong, petty enthusiasms are the kind of people that I think <laughs> we love and who love us. Like, there's this weird little thing that I love, and it's weird, uh, <laughs> but I love it deeply. And that's the kind of person that usually when they find us and we find them, it's sort of like, yes, we're glad you're here. We're glad you showed up. Please tell us all about, like, I don't know, whatever you know about, like, macadamia nuts or <laughs> physics. I don't know much about either of those two things. Um, um, 
At one, one point, my, a big part of my job um, when I was working at the National Library was encouraging the, um, the archivists and the librarians to kind of let things go, you know, like let images... Well, they let people steal or...? Not, not quite that way, although there are some great books and stories about things being stolen from libraries and I know how to steal a map out of a book without anyone noticing, so what you do... Is it like, is it like <laughs> in, um, in Chinatown when he keeps coughing and ripping it against the ruler? There was this really famous case of a guy and he'd, he'd keep a piece of string inside his cheek where it would get all wet and then he'd go into the library um, into the special reading rooms and he would get the books with the valuable maps in them and he'd take the piece of string that was damp out and he would lie that down the seam, down the spine, and he'd shut the book so that the paper would soften and then he would very carefully... So there you go, that's how you steal maps from libraries, but don't. <laughs> That's very upsetting. <laughs> he both licked the books and stole from them. <laughs> then what would he do with like, these damp maps that he got home? <laughs> Sell them. Oh. After they dry. I know. So instead of like... Please don't do this. <laughs> instead of encouraging people to physically steal things, we were more about letting copies go on the internet. So oh, especially okay. of um, photographs and artworks. And so one of my favourite features on the toast is without a doubt the ones that riff on old master paintings. Oh, and, okay, yeah. And I just, I, I've written down some of the titles because I can never remember them. So these are um, articles like Men in Western Art Who Are So Nude It Makes Them Furious <laughs> and Unhappy Little Girls in Western Art History. And there is um, time and time again, it's all those paintings of women who have got their listening face on, mm -hmm. which also looks like their please God let it be over soon yep, yep. face. How do you work these pieces up? Oh my gosh, I, I feel like they're just like a gift to me that is continually like washed up on the sea that is Wikimedia Commons. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's one of my favorite series that I get to do. It's like, like she just said, it's essentially just I caption, you know, public domain art from the last roughly 500 years of Western art history. Um, and it's wonderful. There's so many little wonderful tropes in them. Like there's, there's, there's a whole trope of, of men from Greek myth being painted with a single pink silk scarf covering just their dick. Um, and it's always wonderful and like a little blue sash, like a little blue sash and a little pink sash and one's just a dick ribbon. Um, and it's always wonderful to like kind of click through and see, and they're not connected, they're not by the same artist, it's just this trope of like one pink ribbon for your dick. Um, and they're just always wonderful to see the different arrangements that they'll like, it flows up in some and across in others and it's always like different, it's, you know, it'll be like Icarus flying too close to the sun but he's got his little pink sash on. Um, or like, you know, the, the men who are so nude it makes them furious, like off Often, you know, depictions of heroic nudes would also depict men who are like having really extreme fits of emotion, and so they just look like they're so angry they don't have clothes on. They're just like, oh, <laughs> all of my skin is outside, <laughs> um, and that's really wonderful. And yeah, a lot of the paintings, you get this wonderful realization that like many painters in Western Europe from the last 500 years did not know what boredom looked like, um, and they just thought that this face, like. They were just like, that's what women look like when they're listening. <laughs> so there's all these wonderful paintings titled like an afternoon tea or like normal conversations where everyone's having a good time. And the woman's just like. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no awareness. And I love that. I love that very much. Um, as well as being full of kind of daily amusement and just kind of like these little, little kind of eye-opening moments, um, the toast has also been financially I think one of the phrases for it, financially positive, since we early on. We've never used that phrase, but I like it. <laughs> financially positive. Okay. Um, yeah, we're good. <laughs> from early on in, it, on in its life. And that's, that's quite unusual when it comes to online publishing. And you've also paid all of your contributors yeah, from I mean, that early was on. Something that we just factored in the budget right away, because we knew there were lots of places that it seemed like they would get started and say, we can't afford to pay anyone right now, but that's their goal. And then they would never reach that goal. Um, and it would just kind of always be, you'd check in again a year or two years, five years later. It was like, we're really hoping to get around to that someday. Um, and so it seemed like the kind of thing that if we didn't sort of build that into our financial plan from the start, I don't know how we would have made mm. that a priority later. You know, once you get used to people writing for you for free, you're, you're not going to have a huge incentive to change that. You're not going to turn that off again. Um, at least that's, that's not something I've seen a lot of. Maybe there are a couple sites that, that have... Done, made that transition, and if so, that's fantastic. But um, yeah, I think you and I were talking a little bit backstage about how sometimes it feels like in order to you know, make a go of it, you have to sort of say like, we're gonna raise $20 million mm. and we're gonna get a billion page views by tomorrow. Um, 
which is just partly how getting money works, right? Yeah. You have to make very, very big promises for someone to write you very, very big checks. Um, and we were fortunate enough that like, I was able to quit my job um, and Nicole was able to put up the money that we needed to start, which was nowhere near any millions of dollars. Um, but we sort of thought, you know, if we can just pay our bills and pay our writers, that would be great. Like, we're not looking yeah. to get rich quick. Like, we don't mind waiting a little to get really rich. <laughs> <laughs> just a little. <laughs> like, you know, another year or two, and then I'd like to be enormously rich. Um, so, Ticks from Jane Eyre um, grew out of a story that a reader left on a story, a piece by Nicole? Yes, yes. On Published on the toast or on uh, the hairpin? This was actually before the the, yeah. the toast existed. So Nicole used to do a series called Classic Trash, where she would review like Clan of the Cave Bear, or Naked Came the Stranger, or Gone with the Wind, um, which is a very trashy novel. Even if you love it, it's it's trashy. Um, <coughs> and somebody in the comments had written, you know, because she'd kind of talked about the the characters, and someone in the comments had written, I you know I grew up in the South, and it's still very much like this, except now everyone has cell phones. And I was just like, thank you, stranger, for that life plan. <laughs> um, <laughs> I now know what I'm going to do. Because um, there was something about that that was so, I just, just, especially Scarlett O'Hara, who's such a terrible person, just awful. Um, and the idea of her having a cell phone and like the way that it would enable her to lie to people and to manipulate them. And it wasn't, it wasn't like, ha ha, what if people had phones in the past? So much as just what a great way to like boil down dialogue to its like absolute mm. like barest and have someone just being like, I need this. I want this. I just told you a lie, but I don't care. Um, and so that was really fun. And so text from Scarlett O'Hara was the first one I ever wrote. And then I think pretty quickly after that was Jane Eyre and Little Women. Um, and at that point, I started to think, I might just keep doing this. There's a role here. and I'm There is a I'm real gonna... role. I am on it. <laughs> and I'm just going to go on it until it stops. So how, how did you select? How did you work through the, the authors and the books that you ended up working with? So I was doing the series for a while on the hairpin. And then I had a couple of agents approach me, and I was just shiny and dumb, and I thought, well, an agent is interested in this, so I will have a book in three weeks, and I am just, you're welcome, everybody. <laughs> um, so I found my agent, who I have now, um, and wrote a book proposal in a couple of months, which was like a quarter of the book, plus a table of contents and all of that, and we shopped it around for a couple of months, and we got a lot of, like, very, kind of what you imagine when you think of a cliche Hollywood meeting, like, we love it, it's fantastic, does it have to be text, and does it have to be about literary characters? Have you thought of writing a YA novel? And it would happen <laughs> so fast, that I would be like, wait, what? I, the last thing you said was a compliment, but then you didn't buy this book. I'm very confused, um, and so, we kind of went to everyone in town and nobody wanted it. Um, and and I, I'm i very happy to sell out whenever given the opportunity. So I tried to rewrite it without text and without literary characters. <laughs> I was super happy to do that. Um, I have no problem with that. But nobody wanted it then either because that's not a very good book. <laughs> um, so we stopped and I just thought, okay, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I was sad and I felt disappointed. And then, then, you know, a couple of months after that, Nicole and I started the toast and it was like, fantastic. I own the site. I can write as many texts from as I want. No one can stop me. Um, except for the market if no one reads them. <laughs> um, and so I started doing it again and I think it was helpful for, for some of the editors that had seen it previously mm. to realize there's a little more of an audience here than, than we were aware of and it seems to be succeeding kind of despite having changed platforms. So uh, probably a year and a half after the original rejections, Kate called me and said, you know, there's some interest. Can you bring back the proposal? And this time we were able to sell it. Um, and they let me keep the premise, which was very <laughs> nice of them. Um, and and, and then I and then I wrote it. Um, and were there any any authors or or books where you tried and it didn't work? You couldn't couldn't find the the yeah. in or the voice. There were definitely a handful. Um, I, I'm trying to think of if I can remember any off the top of my head. There were a few more modern ones that just didn't quite work out for me. Um, like I, I have some books that are set in the 20th century, mm. um, but the majority of of the books are, are much older. Um, and, and those were the ones that, you know, I'd read at the youngest age and remembered the most either fondly or like, I really want to say this about Medea. It's time. <laughs> um, the time is right for someone to just really get on Euripides. Um, so there were, there were a couple, I think, that I tried to sort of make it a more contemporary book. And those usually felt forced because they were mm. forced. So those kind of fell by the wayside. Um, but most of the ones that I did were books that I'd read many, many times and felt really strongly about the characters and, and like I wanted to sort of lovingly yell at them. Um, and so this was my chance to yell at people I loved. 
but weren't getting yelled at enough. Um, when I when I read it, when I read much of your writing, I often it's quite a um, you know how the internet can be both extremely public but also feel very intimate? Yes. Feel like people are, are talking quite directly to you despite the fact that it's published on something that's totally accessible. Yeah. And um, I often get the feeling when I'm reading pieces by you that I am in a slightly one-sided Google chat <laughs> conversation, you know, that kind of, it's got that sort of bouncy feeling, you know, yeah, that kind of ding. Yeah, a lot of all cap. Ding. Um, do, you, do, you pre do you work your pieces up? in conversation with people? Uh, definitely less now than I used to, mm -hmm. but yeah, especially in I think the first six months, I had a couple of friends that I was really close with and who, who I think really, we have similar senses of humor. And almost every piece would start out as me just yelling at them in Gchat, like, does this work? Is this funny? <laughs> and then, unless they said very strongly that it didn't, I'd be like, great, thank you for your feedback. It was not feedback, I just needed you to listen. <laughs> I just needed an um, endorsement. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely ways in which I think there's like really marvelous ways that the sort of G-chat conversation that gets published elsewhere is like a really wonderful way of, of reading and, and writing and I like it quite a lot. Um, like there's a piece I did recently that I feel like could not have been published anywhere but online. Mm. Um, and it was, it was something that I wrote in all caps and in second person called Why Are You Lonely? Um, and it was just the sort of thing where it was just like a series of bullet points of me yelling at a fictional person that's also really me. Um, and it was just like, you're lonely because like, you think that time spent with other people that, th that you had to initiate is less authentic than time spent that they on initiated. <laughs> um, or like, you're lonely because you mistook inertia for rest and you watched Netflix for seven hours and you don't know what self-care is because you think it's self-indulgence. Um, <laughs> and that sort of yelling at someone who's really yourself in that very weird, specific, way feels very internet-y to me. Um, obviously none of you guys are lonely. <laughs> I would never say that. And do you ever get requests from people now to text you in persona? No. Like text me like Emily Dickinson? No. Or I'm already giving people so much free content. That would be very <laughs> rude. That would be very rude if people asked me to text them personally. Um, <laughs> No, I do not. And none of my friends want it, you know, because they're my friends. And they've they're already like, seen it all in GJ anyway. No, it is not a request <laughs> that I often get. Um, sorry. <laughs> Spin-off business kind of charge. For I it. don't want to do that. <laughs> it's too much work. Um, the other thing I really, really wanted to talk about is Dear Prudy. So um, do we have Dear Prudy um, readers in the audience as well? The Slate Advice column? Great. Um, You've recently taken over this quite legendary um, online advice column that's published um, in Slate. Mm -hmm. how, did, how did they re reach out to you and how did you react? Um, I absolutely thought it was my friend Nicole playing a joke on me. So I think I wrote back, like, if this is Nicole fucking with me, I'll kill you. And the editor-in-chief of Slate wrote back and was just like, I am neither of those things. <laughs> um, I, was, I was traveling, I was out of town, and I got an email from someone at Slate who I'd never spoken to before, and they said, you know, um, Emily's moving on, she's gonna be taking a job at the Atlantic and we're looking at, at possible replacements and we wanted to know if you'd be interested and it was just, it wasn't even a job I thought was available to people, mm. you know. It's like, it's like, do you wanna be a Vestal Virgin? Like, hell yeah, I do. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, I wish, I wish it was a temple. I wish it was a temple I could go live at and like I had to like offer my life to it for 10 years and then afterwards I could go like retire to the hills of Rome, but. Um, yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. It was not a job I had even, it was like being asked, do you want to be Santa Claus for a while? Um, like, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I did a couple of sample columns with them and then they, they offered me the job and I like very briefly checked in with Nicole in a way that was like, please don't say no because <laughs> I really want to do this. And she said, go for it. Um, so it was totally unexpected, totally unlooked for. Um, it was really nerve wracking writing sample columns and trying to figure out a balance between, you know, my my style is very boisterous and over the top mm. and sometimes involves a lot of yelling and um, you have to tone that down a little bit if you're trying to give people advice. So trying to figure out <laughs> the, the difference between the Mallory of the Toast and the Mallory of Dear Prudence has been really interesting and a lot of fun because um, I want to be still me, but a little, I don't want to terrify people away. I don't want to be like the Sphinx that like, the, the lady <laughs> Sphinx, you know, who like yells at you like, you're going to kill your dad. Um, <laughs> Or that's not what the Sphinx did. She asked him a riddle. She wasn't the oracle. I'm mixing up the hearts <laughs> of the myth, but you know what I mean. It's you still a good kind of mental cheat to have in the back yeah, of your head. Yeah, like, I don't want am to I about to like, that? eat people if you answer my riddle wrong? So the, um, uh, over the weekend, I went, I went back through a bunch of the questions that you've been asked, and they're, they're pretty startling in their diversity. 
Um, everything. People have problems, man. <laughs> everything from, um, I really felt for this, this lady, a woman who was struggling. Um, she had, had an earlier marriage. Her husband died young. She has remarried, started a new family, but her first husband's family have bought her a plot next to his grave. Yes. And uh, fully expecting her to be laid to rest at some point next door to him right. rather than with her new family or right. somewhere else that she would like to pick. Um, through to um, what sounded like a student's dilemma about equitable toilet paper purchasing behaviour in the house. Oh, yeah, because I think they would have been reduced to like hoarding their own toilet paper <laughs> in their room and then waiting to yeah. see if their roommate would notice. And I think it, I think it was a he. I might be okay. projecting here, but like he goes out and he buys large quantities oh, yeah, of Costco quite and good quali ton. quality yep. toilet paper and then a flatmate buys very small quantities of very bad toilet paper that he doesn't yep. like yep. using. And well, that's hard because it's sort of like a game of chicken and whoever cares less about toilet paper wins, right? <laughs> I mean, you're clearly like, you've already stared death in the face. You don't give a shit. Like you're, yeah, yeah. you're the kind of person who's like, oh, we're out of toilet paper? Yeah. I don't care. I'll go to a yeah. Burger King. Yeah. I'll like, I'll use a towel and throw it away. I <laughs> do not, like that person, does, is, is afraid of nothing and you can't you can't berate that person into like you you have to just accept that they've already won before you start <laughs> they've won yeah the toilet paper game yeah yeah literal race to the bottom yeah because <laughs> it was hard right because it was like they're like they're sort of buying toilet paper it wasn't like this person wasn't contributing to the house at all it was just less and and it's it's tough like it'd be one thing if they never did it and like yeah you could get away with like calling a meeting and saying like you have to buy toilet paper twice a month or something but like when they're already in on it but not quite pulling their own <laughs> weight and they clearly are like one ply is fine yeah. like a monster <laughs> um, what can you do what can you do yeah, that I'm person's stronger than than I will ever be <laughs> clearly clearly some of these are, are very complex sorry this is like no, no, I've no. thought about this one so much but <laughs> Like the wor the lady who's worried about where she's gonna die, like it's fine, but the toilet paper one really keeps me up. I think um, I think one of the other ones that you were you had quite a strong view on mm -hmm. was um, the woman whose husband kept on leaving pee spots around the toilet, and whether she should say something to him or not. Yeah, you should say something. <laughs> You're married to him, and he's leaving <laughs> piss on the floor. <laughs> Uh, why would you, wh why, why is that something to be coy about? Like, oh, I don't want to ruin the magic of like our <laughs> piss floor. <laughs> like, I've, that's some things I, I truly don't understand when someone doesn't speak up. And I mean, I can understand. I understand why sometimes someone doesn't speak up in the moment. But like, this is a moment that calls for a little bit of courage. And all you need to say is like, hey, when you piss on the floor, <laughs> clean it up. If I see piss on the floor, I'm gonna come find you and say you pissed on the floor. <laughs> Clean it up. You're a human being. <laughs> I, like you notice if you leave piss on the floor, or if you haven't in the past, start looking at the floor briefly before you leave a room. <laughs> this also, by the way, holds true for public restrooms. Ladies, if you hover and you leave little pee splashes on the seat, I, I see it. <laughs> you left pee on the seat. <laughs> We're human beings. We have to live in a society together and we can't murder each other. <laughs> so if you hover and you left pee on the seat, please just, just wipe it off with some more toilet paper. That's all I ask. You can still hover. Hover to your heart's content. But like, I, I believe firmly that if you're a human being who leaves pee behind you, it's on you, that human being, to remove the remains of your pee. That's why I came here. <laughs> <laughs> to this country. <laughs> it means a lot to me. It's just like, life's already so hard. It's so, so hard. The least you can do is not make somebody else have to look at your old piss. That, that and grapes with seeds in them. So backstage, there are <laughs> grapes in the little green room, and they have seeds in them. 29 years old, I've never had a grape with a seed in it. So I put a grape in my mouth, expecting a grape, and I get a grape plus a surprise. <laughs> and it terrified and intrigued me. I was like a dog that had just eaten peanut butter for the first time. And I did it like five more times and each time I was as surprised as the first time. So I kept being like. <laughs> and it really freaked me out. Do all the grapes here have seeds? Maybe. There we go. Maybe most of the ones that are grown locally. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's great. I, like, it was a shock to me, but I liked it. <laughs> You can be our grape ambassador to the world. <laughs> you try grapes. grapes, not like Sometimes they else. have seeds. <laughs> um, 
going back to the advice. <laughs> <laughs> You, as well as doing the kind All of... All I talked about today was piss and grapes. <laughs> <laughs> and so about not aspiring to be Lizzie Bennet, I'm like giving so up sorry. on that dream. I mean, clearly I'm not, right? Like, clearly <laughs> that, that dream is dead. Um, as well as taking on the kind of traditional write-in, send, send your letter in to Dear Prudy and then you publish a, a mm -hmm. series, there's also a live chat yes. that you do. Yes. How do you... Um, how Because that's quite full-on, yes. really, because yeah. you are this massive... Um, spectrum of things that you're dealing with. How do you prepare for one of those live chat sessions? So the live chat is something that gives me serious anxiety every week because I'm always convinced I'm going to sleep through it, right? And then they're going to be like, well, this is why you should never hire millennials. They don't take their responsibility seriously. <laughs> um, so every Sunday, because the live chat is noon East Coast time. I live on the West Coast. So it's 9 a.m. my time. So every Sunday night, I'm just like, wake up tomorrow <laughs> before 9. Like, I just say that quietly to myself. And I set, like, seven alarms. The first couple weeks, I had friends call me. I was like, just in case. I need you to call me at 7. I need you to call me at 7.15. It takes a village <laughs> for me to be on time to work. Um, and it's actually set up really well. Like, you know, they have a good system going. You know, Dear Prudence existed before me, and it will exist after me. So I'm just glad to, like, be a part of the system for a little while. But there's this big Google Doc. And they, they someone goes in and wades into this big... I assume, pool of questions and then, you know, hoists them out with strong arms and like lines them up in order. And then we have like a live chat going on separately just with the team and the side and I'll start saying like, you know, I have these two questions answered. I'm working on this one now. And then they publish it for me. So all I have to do is answer the questions and mm. someone does all the rest of it for me. Um, but it's definitely, it's totally unlike any other kind of writing I've done before. Um, and often people will, will write in, you know, as, as the live chat's going to, to sort of either I'll open up a question to the audience if, if it has like a, a medical or a legal or some mm. kind of aspect that I don't know anything about and they'll give their opinion and lots of people will feel very strongly about um, you know, what the person should or shouldn't do. So that's always really interesting to get, like, instant feedback. Yeah. Um, but it's a lot of fun. How much of the, um, the ad this kind of advice process, do you think, comes down to people wanting to be told that they're not alone in their situation or the feelings that they're having, or that they're not horrible people mm -hmm. for the feelings that they're having or the situations that they find themselves in? So there's a real, there's a real split. I think there's lots of questions where someone wants to know, you know, am I alone? Am I really unusual for feeling this way or having done this? Um, a lot of them are, I've already done this thing. Someone's trying to make me feel really bad about it. Should I be feeling really bad about it? Um, a lot of them are, I feel great about what I've done and I just want to let you know how good it was. <laughs> and those are often really interesting, especially when I think they should not have done that. And I get to kind of say, I really disagree. I think you did a bad thing. Um, so, so quite a few of them are from someone who's kind of vulnerable and afraid, and quite a few of them are from someone who feels like, I was really justified in doing this, like, can you back me up? And sometimes I can, and sometimes I don't. Um, so those are always really interesting to me to see the questions where I feel like some people are really paralyzed by self-doubt, and they're constantly questioning themselves, and some people don't question themselves enough and um, need to be sort of gently encouraged to do a little bit more of that. Um, so it's really interesting to see the difference in those mm. types of questions. And do you think people follow the advice? I have no idea. Do I we ever no hear idea. back from them? You know, I've been doing it for a short enough time, only about five right. months that, or four months. It's kind of hard to, to gauge yet. Um, I think a lot of what people are just looking for is reassurance. Um, I think a lot of people have already got their minds made up and are just, it helps them to talk through it out loud. Um, I'm sure some percentage of people are moved in a direction of maybe 10 to 15% of change. Um, and maybe a handful of people actually didn't know what they were going to do mm. and actually take the advice. Um, but I don't feel, I feel like what a lot of people are looking for is just, I need an outsider's perspective on my situation. That's all they need. I, I don't, so I don't feel real responsible, like, oh, I could ruin someone's life. Like, I believe the people who are writing into me have lived their lives mm. up until this point without my input. They're probably going to be okay, <laughs> you know, whatever my input was. So I don't, I don't feel too stressed out about that. And we talked about this briefly um, backstage as well. So um, I recently saw someone speak, you know, someone said on the internet, <laughs> speculating online about um, that we, we have medications to help with our depression and we have medications to help with our anxiety. Why, why shouldn't we just have a medication to fix heartbreak so that, yeah. you know, a relationship goes south or something terrible happens and you just take some pills and it all goes away. Do you, 
As, as an advice columnist and as a writer, what do you think? I mean, I think that sounds a lot like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which I hated. <laughs> um, such a stupid movie. I wish I could forget that I saw that movie, which I'm sure now that I think about it was in like half the like panned reviews of it. And so I apologize for making such a predictable joke about that terrible garbage movie that was terrible. Um, and I think I told you backstage that I also thought that was really silly. I mean, um, I, I think heartbreak is substantially different from something like clinical depression or clinical anxiety. It's a natural response to the fact that like life has pain in it. Um, and so I don't, I don't even know how you would begin to go about coming up with medication for it. Um, I think it's very good if, if you need medical intervention mm -hmm. for chronic or clinical depression to take it. Um, but I think just the fact that sometimes people can make you sad if they don't love you anymore, there's not a way to get out of it unless you want to make a really terrible movie with Kate Winslet and Jim Carrey. <laughs> um, I mean, if, if that doesn't prove it doesn't work, I don't know what it does. <laughs> that could have just been the gift response to that particular article. Yeah, I mean, I think one of, yeah, no, that's, we would have no breakup songs. <laughs> And no breakup books, yeah. That would be very sad. No emos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you, you do, you live quite publicly online. I mean, you recently um, put your uh, phone number Hell yeah. out on Twitter so that people, tell us that story. It was great. <laughs> um, it worked out super good. So in some ways I live really publicly online and in other ways I really don't. Like I don't write very much about my personal life. Um, I, 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 Definitely stay away from that type of writing. Um, not because I think it's not worthwhile, I just, other people do it really, really well and I don't. Um, so in some ways, it can appear very public, but mm. there's actually a lot that I hold back. Like there's, there's lots that I'm super happy to discuss yeah. and lots that I'm just like, nope, we will not be discussing that. But one of the things I've always felt really strongly about is I'm as much a private figure as I'm a public figure. Like I got on Twitter in 2009 when no, you know, nobody I knew was on it, and I was mm. just like, I had a bacon sandwich today. It was good. Um, and I feel like I still get to have that as much as I want. Um, so I sort of, sometimes people will ask in a way that's sort of designed to get a certain answer, like, you're a woman on the internet. That must be awful. <laughs> and that's not to say that, like, gendered abuse is not a very real problem mm. of being online, but I also don't like how sometimes it can turn into, well, it must just be terrible for you. Um, because it isn't. It's wonderful. And, and I feel like very much, you know, as, as my career has, has moved in a really great direction and as I've gotten a wider Twitter audience, it's still my account. Like, it's still me. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so I have this friend who's very, like, she's a lawyer and she's always very like, don't say that, like, don't say where you are on Twitter, like, people could find you. Um, <laughs> in a way that's sort of like my grandma, where she's just always like, now, when you go out of town, like, have someone take your newspaper so no one knows you're out of town. And I was like, Ava, I don't get a newspaper. Um, I don't know how to explain that to you. Um, <laughs> So I would do it occasionally, like, you know, back when I was just using Twitter and it was me and a handful of friends, I'd be like, hey, I'm on the corner of whatever street, meet you there soon. And she'd be like, don't do that. Or I'd be like, here's my number if I was, like, making a friend because mm. I've, I've made quite a few friends from Twitter. Um, and I just really, I don't bristle at a lot of things, but I bristle at the idea that I have to stop doing that um, if, I, if, I, if I wanted to do it, that I couldn't do it. So just sort of both to that friend in particular and to the idea that, like, oh, now that I'm at a certain level of, of visibility, I have to stop doing the kinds of things I would want to do. I was like... Here's my phone number. What are you gonna do? Like, no one, nothing bad's gonna happen. It was awesome. Put my phone number out on Twitter, and I got like 14 calls that night. And every time I was just like walking around my neighborhood, the sun was setting. It was really beautiful. I had my dog. And I was just like, is this someone from the internet? <laughs> <laughs> and I got these like wonderful calls from like, and it was really great because we got to do like three and four way calling, which I have not done since middle school. <laughs> it's like, hang on, I think somebody else is calling. I think I can add them into this talk. So I'd be like, where are you from? Um, and we'd all just be kind of chatting, and it was delightful. Like just really nice, lovely people wanting to say hello. Um, and I got maybe like 500 texts over the course of the evening. I eventually did have to delete that tweet, but not because it wasn't <laughs> great, just like because I thought, I need to text everybody back, and my hand is hurt. Um, <laughs> and I got pictures of people's dogs, I got pictures of people's cats, I got pictures of people's dinner. People were just like, I really liked your book, and here's another book I'm reading that you might like. It was, without exception, mm -hmm. positive and delightful. Um, and, and I don't think that needs to say anything about how we live today or these modern times. Um, I think it's just possible to have a really positive experience with strangers online, um, and it was fun, and I did it because I wanted to, and suck it, Jasmine. Um, <laughs> that's my friend. I hope you're watching right now, and I can tell you, you're too worried about me. 
you're, you're not too worried about me. You're very wise, and I should, <laughs> I should listen to you more often, and you have strep throat right now, and I'm being mean to you in front of New Zealanders, which I'm sorry. I hope you feel better soon, and I'll never do it again. That's what I would like to say to Jasmine. <laughs> She's really nice. It is, because we do tend to um, tie ourselves up in knots about being women on the internet, and the conversations that are swirling around today. It's nice to remember that there are these ways of just having kind of surprising and delightful experiences. Yeah, and, and I want to do it in a way that doesn't downplay the fact that harassment and gendered abuse and racialized abuse are really serious problems online, because they absolutely are. But I think as important as those conversations are to have, I also don't like that sometimes it turns into this flip of, well, you're a woman online, that must be awful. Like, no, there's great things too. Um, and I don't encourage in any way anyone else putting their phone number online, like, please, <laughs> don't dox yourself if you don't deeply want to. Um, but but I do want to also acknowledge that there's a lot of good, too. And, mm. and I think that that's also important. Um, for whatever it's worth. Caitlin Moran wrote a piece for The Guardian over the weekend, which was about being online, okay. about kind of living online, and, and some of the things that she... She was basically kind of taking the don't be a dick approach. Like, if you tone down your dickishness, then people are likely to be less dickish and response and so she was saying things like maybe maybe don't jump straight into calling people Tory scum or um, champagne socialists or you know don't 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 be quite so aggressive mm. online create create the online world that you want to be in I think that's helpful in in one sense but I think when it comes to dealing with like gendered and racialized harassment that's just not helpful um, like if you've got a lot of eggs coming at you calling you racial slurs I don't think saying back really nicely that's not kind is going to do anything and I think <laughs> That sort of requires a more, <laughs> I think that requires more of a systemic response, right? Like, uh, I, we're talking a lot about Twitter as a platform, and mm. they have a notoriously terrible response to harassment, which is just sort of, we don't care. Um, and I think that's in many ways a function of the fact that it's a culture primarily comprised of white men, white straight men. Um, and so, absolutely, I think it's great to sort of think about what kind of discourse do we want to have, and how do we want to talk to people? That's wonderful. But when it comes to the sort of harassment that's endemic to Twitter, um, especially for women of color, mm -hmm. and especially for trans women and for queer women, um, it's relentless, it's violent, it's, it's dark, um, it's constant, and it's not, you can't nice it away. You can't friendly it away. Um, and, it, and it needs like an actual response from, from Twitter itself. Um, so I would put those in really separate categories. Mm. Like, great, don't call people scum. That's probably good life advice. Um, champagne socialist, isn't that mean? I don't think. <laughs> like, if that's the worst thing someone's called you, it's Avald. They said you can afford champagne. <laughs> um, and that's a really different level of, of insult than the sort of insult you see from like an egg account on Twitter, which mm. is just like horrible. You know the words that they use. I'm not going to say any of them. Um, so for whatever it's worth, I think there's an important distinction to be made there. I like, um, it just strikes me when you say egg account, I've never heard of it described oh. that way. And so um, you're talking about the, the accounts that are kind of set up just to... So, yes, yeah. sorry. If you get an account on Twitter and you don't personalize it in any way, the automatic avatar is a little blue background with a little white egg. It's just like a drawing of an egg. And so it's sort of notorious that an egg account is usually just a throwaway account created by someone who's often a serial harasser looking to say really trollish or outrageous and awful things. Um, so if somebody just has an egg as an avatar, odds are they're about to say like something really awful. I think this is quite a New Zealand thing because um, when, when you say egg like that in New Zealand, it's, an, it's a bit of an, it's a, like a, a low level friendly insult. It's like, oh, you egg. Oh, I'm so You're sorry. A, oh, no, no, no. It's kind of, it's I'm perfect. so sorry, guys. No, it's perfect. It's okay. kind of, it's such a nice response. Like, you've got these, these kind of dickhead accounts, and then every time you describe them as an egg account, it's like, oh, you egg. Yeah. Like, oh. Egg. <laughs> yeah. Egg. Yeah. Egg. Good. Okay. That's really good to know. I can bring you can that take back. That home as well. I will. I will take it back. I'll be like, in New Zealand, you're a mild insult. <laughs> so, suck it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I had one more question before we, um, we bring up the lights and we, we open up the floor to um, other people who might have some questions. And it was, if in the future someone was going to name some kind of worthy institution after you... Jesus, God. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like? If somebody named an institution after me, what would I like them to call it? Or what kind of institution? This is not the question I thought you were going <laughs> to ask me. Wow. So in the future, I'm getting a lot of establishment recognition. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I've been hoping to sell out. Um, 
I have never thought about this. Um, I have often thought about how great it would be if just like everyone rose up as one and said like, Mallory, we love you. You are without flaw. You've never made an error. Um, you've never made a mistake in judgment. You are the perfect human. And, and you've never said anything bad or, you know, Sounding like a cult center at yeah, the moment. <laughs> frankly, let's go with just like the, the Mallory Orberg hall of reorienting Fine. thought. <laughs> um, really, really sinister, kind of Scientology <laughs> sounding. Um, I, I don't know. That is a great question, and I will dedicate the rest of my life to thinking about it. Um, nothing's ever been named after me, but I'd sure be open to it. <laughs> <laughs>